Knock High. Hello, welcome to Knock Knock High with the Glockenfleckens. So we got Kristen Flannery. That's here. me, Lady Glockenflecken. And we got Will Flannery, Dr. Glockenflecken. Together we are the Glockenfleckens, and we have a very, very exciting show. We are uh, we are pumped about this one. Yes, one of um, my all-time favorite doctors is here today. We'll get to that in a second. Yes. Uh first, let's let's what's going on? So you just a lot. I asked you like like you don't know what's going on like we don't live together in the same house, mm. um, but you just got back from a trip. I did. You yes. were at a conference. Yes, I was. Uh, An a education education conference. conference. That's right. So we and been... I got to be a solo parent for like ten days. Yeah, while you were gone. I, I wasn't sure what I would come back to. So it the kids it, are alive. The house wasn't burned down. They are, un, they are unharmed. They're unscathed. A little dirty, a little stinky. But, but did you enjoy the conference? Um, yeah, it was good. I ran the the booth for my organization that I was representing, so I got to stay in the exhibit hall all day long. And, uh, and, and it's talk like to a people. straight education, like it's this it's an uh, association for gifted for gifted children, gifted yes, children. Yep. Mm-hmm. And you ran the booth. I did. Uh, my most important question for you: Did you have swag? Of course, you have to have swag. Nobody comes to your booth if you don't have any swag. So, so. it's the same uh, for like medical conferences. Yeah, that's yep. But what kind mm-hmm. of swag? Because I've never been to an education conference. So what kind mm-hmm. of swag did you offer? Oh uh, well, you know, at an education conference, it's, it's a lot of stuff like teacher stuff, right? Like there's going to be like pencils and little handheld puzzles and things like that. But uh, we had uh, these little square shaped keychains with our uh, logo on it uh but then it was a little multi-tool so on the little square there was like a level right like the the a level a level the that you like would okay. hang a picture with oh gotcha right? all right so there's a little level in there and then uh so people would come up and they'd check it out and they'd be like oh there's a little level and then i'd be like well did you notice it's actually a multi-tool there's a little tape measure and i'd pull it out from the bottom this little tape measure and they lost their minds teachers love a good measurement system so yeah i would pull it out and they'd be like oh my gosh and then they would want like two or three to take with them so it was a big hit okay i mean not to toot my own horn but they enjoyed they enjoyed the measurements they did yeah they do the only criticism i got was oh i wish this was the metric system (laughs) So <laughs> the metric they so that was the only downside. Yep, yep. Well, inches, it, not centimeters. We, we, we have uh I'm I'm so glad that they get excited about that. They do, they get so excited. Did you they have a lot of traffic it. at your booth because of these multi-tools? Yeah, we had people no, I'm not kidding you. There was like word spread around the conference that you had to come down to our booth to get one. They loved it. Uh, medical conferences are a little bit different, but that's it's yeah. also a very important part of the conference going experience. Right. We have to have swag. Right. And usually it's like usually your swag is better. Yeah, like there's like you have different well, the, different budgets. For me, it's like I it's not it's never for me. It's it's always like what can I my kid as soon as I walk in the door, right. our kids are going to What'd you bring me? demand something. Right. Right. Because once I, I did it like the first conference I went to. Yeah, that was your And first once you mistake. do it the first the time, tone. they they have to have the gift, the, the whatever it is. So right. so that right. that's that's what I'm looking for. Like one time, at one ophthalmology conference, they had fidget spinners. Mm, yeah, that, that was lit a good up. one. They like they, they play with that for quite some time. Right, yeah. Usually, no, usually it's like a gift. Like you give it to them and then they just kind of forget about it because right. it's not that exciting, to be honest. Right, it's just free garbage toys. So... That's all. But I did find, so I thought about the same thing, have to bring the kids something. And so actually in the hotel where I stayed, I stayed separate from the conference hotel. And in the hotel I stayed, they were having another conference that was a medical conference. It was for physician recruiters. And they had the exhibit tables just lined up along a hallway that was just publicly accessible. And so I just went shopping after (laughs) hours. And I just picked up a little of this, a little bit of that. Got some little squishy fishies, right? They were okay. like these little handheld squishy like a, toys. Like a stress ball type uh-huh, thing? Uh-huh, like a stress ball, but it was in the shape of a fish. So, yeah, these that was These are the a things that we get excited about. 
this we're is old now. When you're when you're married with with kids, and we are both in our late thirties, um, we get excitement any way we can. It's and true. so, swag, mostly just trying to avoid pain at this point. So, trying to avoid the sure. the confrontation of you didn't get me anything. Just make things as smooth as possible when you walk in the door. That's very That's true. Exciting. Well, I think you did good. I think they were happy with what you yeah, found. Yeah, they liked it. They're good. So let's let's uh we'll, we'll get into it. Um, uh, let's talk about our guest. All right. We have yes. Dr. Jen Gunter. Yes. Very excited about Very this. Very excited. She's a big name in the medical world. Uh, very awesome gynecologist, author, lots of things. She's a New York Times columnist. She covers women's health. Um, she's written several books. Yes. Uh, and uh, I think she has a book coming out she'll talk about too. And uh, she's a specialist in chronic pain ma- uh, medicine and vulvovaginal disorders. And she's also from Canada. That's true. Which is exciting. Uh, and she'll talk about that as well. Yeah. So uh, we're excited. Uh, let's get started. Let's All get right. going. All right. Here we go. All right, Jen, thank you so much for joining us. I, I can't tell you how excited I am to uh, to-, to finally get to talk to you. This is, this is great. Um, you may be the first ob that he's ever seen in real life. Well, <laughs> I, I, you know, you did have two children. And so I, this is true. I, I have met at least I forgot a that you were there. Ones. Yes. <laughs> and once upon a time I did do an OBGYN rotation in med school. Oh, I yeah. definitely forgot that. So Jen, did you, you forgot everything about that's, it. That's right. Jen, do you, do you work with Med students or resident. When was the last time you kind of interacted with trainees and? Uh, well, they, you know, so I'm very, very subspecialized. So, yeah. and you know what happens? Like the further down the subspecialty tree you get, the fewer and fewer interactions you get because um, people don't want to know about you unless they really need you, and then they then they really <laughs> want to know about you, right? That's right. <laughs> so, um, so I don't get that many medical students or residents anymore, which is sad because uh, mm-hmm. I I really enjoyed it. Uh, but um, every now and then they percolate through, and yeah, yeah. and then they get like the full on experience. <laughs> oh gosh. Well, we um, this another reason I'm excited to, to talk with you is because I first knew about you from Twitter, and I got my start on Twitter on social media. That was the first Glock and Fleck and you know the place you could first find me. And I remember seeing you come across my you know feed on Twitter. Be like, who is this person, and how does she have so many followers? Like, how do you how do you get an audience on this on this app? It didn't make sense to me. And uh, so I've been following you since the beginning, and uh, um, it's 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 been a pleasure. It really has oh. been. It's been. Yeah, fun. she's well, your fairy god gynecologist. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I, I guess so. I feel like I know you, even though this is the first time we're actually talking <laughs> to each other in person. It's you know that's one of the amazing things about Twitter, um, and one of the sad things I guess with everything that's kind of going on is that it has been this amazing place where people have really forged amazing friendships. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I've met many people in real life and, you know, you get to know people and yeah, I mean, we've been friends on Twitter for, I want to say like, it must be five years, six years. I don't know, maybe longer. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, by the time people like hear this at Twitter, I don't know what's going to happen. I feel like it's being blown a little bit out of proportion. Like all the, the doomsday Twitter is going to go away. I almost feel like it can't, it has to exist in some form in people's lives. Uh, I could be wrong. Maybe it'll go away next week. Who knows? Where else will everyone go to complain? I mean, you can't. There are plenty of social media apps for people to complain. I, 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 that's that's the one constant is people will complain on social media yeah. somewhere. But um, I don't know. We'll yeah, see. I don't know. I think one of the concepts that's really difficult for us to imagine is, you know, none of us know what it's like to have money to burn. And mm. uh, when $44 billion isn't a game changer for you, you know, all bets are off. Incredible. <laughs> true. Right. I, I can't, I honestly can't even believe it's, it's, it's happening the way it is, but um you know, just, I'm going to stay on it. I, I'm yeah. going to go down with the ship if if it uh, if it does go down. I don't know about you. Are you going to? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I've always thought of Twitter as the biggest cocktail party in the world. And I throw a good party. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm a girl from Winnipeg at heart, and we close parties. Um, bars there are open till 2 in the morning, and there are many after bars clubs to go to. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm 
is that uh, right? I've got a, yeah, oh yeah. I'm, I've I'm been, not. I'm. I've never been to Winnipeg, so I. Wait, this is fascinating to me. Okay. It's it's um it's it's a special place in a lot of ways, but everybody from Winnipeg parties very hard, or many oh, of us do. So yeah, so I'm there till the end, baby. <laughs> you and me, we'll be like, you know, <laughs> closing it down. <laughs> that's right. Closing it down. <laughs> Good. That's 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 what we hope for. Um, and so uh, I'm excited to hear. It sounds like I think you brought a couple stories for us, right? You, sure. I mean, I have I, stories. I have oh, all I'm kinds sure you of have stories. tons of stories, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like you can't you practice medicine for a certain number of years without just accumulating all kinds of interesting, strange encounters and stories. So, so what do you have? Let's. I, I want to hear something. Let's hear it. Well, I, you know, the story that I think is is one of the most interesting is the one that you know happened to me was when I was 11 and I was skateboarding and I was not very good. <laughs> and I fell on my back and it hurt a lot. And, you know, I rode my bike home because that's what you did when you're a girl from Winnipeg. <laughs> and uh, I spent the whole night in agony. And uh, my mom, who was not a very nice person, uh, said it was my fault for skateboarding. And uh, we had the good fortune of mm -hmm. living a few doors down from a pediatric surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she spoke to him in the morning and said, well, I, he said, I know Jennifer and she's not a complainer. So <laughs> I, maybe you should take her to the doctor. And so we went to the doctor, but my mother, an interesting character, uh, didn't drive because that's a sign of weakness. Um, and oh. so uh, we took the bus uh, to the doctor gotcha. and turns out I had a ruptured spleen. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. I spent the whole night that way. I spent the night with a ruptured spleen. I walked to the bus with a ruptured spleen. Oh. Um, and this was back in the day when um, CT scans didn't exist. Ultrasounds didn't exist. And so I had to have an emergency angiogram. Oh, wow. Yeah. Do you remember, was, was this pain, like how much pain were you in? Um, Do you remember well, that? Always less pain than my mother could inflict. So let's put it that way. <laughs> Close, but, you know, it was always a line you walked. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, yeah, I, so I got to the emergency department and they were going to give me what I'm going to guess is Valium. They were going to give me this injection. And I said, can I watch? And I was, you know, precocious. Is, I'm sure that's shocking. And uh, and so I said, I can hold still. Uh, and they said, Okay. And I got to watch the whole thing. And that's when I got interested in medicine. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> See, the yeah. spleen is good for something. It brought the us spleen, Dr. Right? Dr. Your I nemesis. mean, it, the spleen did, you know, I've, you know, people know that I, I make fun of the spleen a lot because ultimately I think we should have two livers instead of a, a liver and a spleen. Um, I think that would, that would serve everyone quite well. Um, but even so, even though it did provide this wonderful story and it sent you on a path to medicine, it's um, uh, it's still screwed up. It's uh, it's it's still a bad thing. The spleen did something that wasn't good to you, and so well, I stand by my assessment of how important the spleen is. But what if you heard out my spleen actually helped me medically too? Because when they did the angiogram for my spleen, they found out I had kidney disease. Oh really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. How, how did they no. find that out? Um, I guess my left kidney didn't take up the dye properly. Oh. So then I had a whole bunch of tests and found out I had hydronephrosis of my left kidney. So I essentially had to have my kidney removed because I ruptured my spleen. How's that for a story? Ooh, they took out another wow. organ with it. They just two for what? Was it at the same surgery? No, they didn't or take my spleen out oh. because of my oh, mother's okay. negligence. I, they, they decided to manage me conservatively. Oh, really? Uh, well, yeah. So I, nice. I was one of the first cases apparently at that hospital managed, if splenic rupture managed conservatively. So. How do you, how do you manage a ruptured spleen I conservatively? Guess tamp I don't know. It had tampon out. It had stopped bleeding. I mean, I don't know. I was 11, so I wasn't, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I wasn't too up to date on any of it, but yeah, the end of the story was I kept my spleen and lost a kidney. Okay. All right. That wasn't the organ you thought you'd lose. Um, most it, it, importantly, did you ever go back to skateboarding? No. <laughs> that was, what time of year was this in Winnipeg? Oh, it was the summer or spring, I think. I think it was May. I, yeah. I assume there's not a lot of skateboarding opportunities in the winter in Winnipeg. <laughs> Which is what, nine months of the year? Yeah, it's cold a lot. We call it winter peg. Um, <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and like I said, we're hardy folk. <laughs> were you wearing a helmet? 
Uh, no. Ooh, good question. It was this like was 1970. This is yeah. before. This is this is before people <laughs> knew that you could hurt your head doing these types of activities. Right, and wrist injuries, right, <laughs> right. and all this stuff. So that was the first wave of skateboarding. So anyway, gotcha. yeah, that that was my big introduction to the healthcare system, and I just thought it was cool. I was, I was fascinated that everybody talked to me like I was an adult, which probably mm-hmm. wasn't good for most eleven-year-olds, but for me was right. And so uh, the, you know, the doctors explained everything to me and they talked to me just like I was an adult and I loved it. And I thought, wow, this is a place where, where people do cool things and they explain things and those things are really neat. And I want to be a doctor. I feel like that's a very forward thinking way of approaching patient communication. Like it's just speaking with a child, you know, as if, you know, not underestimating their intelligence and right. and what they can understand and know. Um, because I, I think a lot of people do that. A lot of people just assume that they're not going to be on a certain level and, and can, you know, talk down to kids. And I think um, that's, that's, that's great. And I mean, it might not have worked for every kid. Certainly, mm-hmm. you know, my kids have had a lot of medical issues and I'm not sure it would have worked for them. So it might've just been bad luck. Like, blind luck basically. And it was the right thing for me. But when my, um, when the pediatric urologist was explaining about, you know, what was going on with my kidney, uh, he was explaining it to my mom who did not understand. I mean, she left school when she was 12 or 13. Mm. So, um, so he, you know, she just, she was not getting it. And so I think out of frustration, he looked at me and said, why don't you come and sit over here and I'll explain it to you. And I totally understood it. And What's really fascinating is, you know, when I was in medical school years later and they were explaining UPJ obstructions, which is what I had, it was no different than what I'd been told when I was 11. Wow. And so that's how good he'd been at explaining it. And I was sitting there going, oh, I know the answer to this one. (laughs) (laughs) And you said it it sent you on a a path to medicine and and made you want to interested in being a doctor. Um, were you, did you want to be a surgeon? Did you want to be taking out spleens and kidneys? <laughs> no, I don't know really what I wanted to be. I found, I don't know what it was like for you, but I found the whole thing very overwhelming at the beginning. I mean, our first class was on the brachial plexus. Like what's up with that? That's the first thing. That was the very right first the lecture. Bat? Trying to weed right you out. off the bat. That was like having a fire hose that's in the no face. Good. That's no good. That's I, like the med school equivalent of OCHEM in, grad, in uh, undergrad. Just okay. like you, you put that out there and it gets rid of it. Everybody who's not going to be serious enough or. Yeah. Enough like it's, I, I'm trying to, that, that would be on the short list of, of the worst ways to start med school. I think yeah. brachial plexus, like Krebs cycle, coagulation yeah. cascade, like all right. of these things would scare the hell out of most people. Yeah. I find no, it interesting like, though, that you're scared by these concepts, but cutting open a dead human, totally fine. You're good with that. Well, it's uh Good point. I, this is why I have Kristen here, because she yeah. can think. Uh, uh, she knows all the things that you know we do in med school and things, the experiences, just not normal. and um, and we, that we think are normal. And she recognizes that no, these are very much not normal things that we're doing. So it's good to have that foil because it's true. You get very like, oh well, it, you know, this is just isn't this just the way everybody thinks? And I think sometimes that's really bad when we're trying to explain things as doctors, right? Because we forget how much basic knowledge we have on the subject. Yeah, and that's why you know my partner, you know, often stop me. He'll be like, okay, so you assume everybody knows how you got to point C, but but we actually don't. So you right. need to go back and explain that. Did you? Was there a turning point for you in med school? You said it was hard at first. Did you? At what point did you start to kind of get it and feel comfortable? Um, I don't think I really felt comfortable until I got on the wards. Uh, And, uh, you know, I think that since I was very comfortable talking with adults and, and sort of interacting with people in that way, I found that it was super easy, not easy, but I felt really comfortable taking histories from people, interacting with people. And then it started to all make sense. Like all this weird, you know, biology that you learn in this very sort of sterile environment that's not connected to somebody's actual life, that it, just all of a sudden, all the puzzle pieces started to fall into place. And I was like, oh, that's why that's important. Oh, and I was right. like, why, like, why could we not have done this earlier? You know? Yeah. It provided that context. 
Yeah. yeah. How how was your, I have a, another very important question for you. How was mm-hmm. your ophthalmology education in med school? <laughs> this is okay. So <laughs> I don't. I think we had one lecture on the eye. One I lecture. don't know. Maybe there was more than one. I don't remember at all. I'm sorry. And we had no clinical ophthalmology experience. The only thing I learned about it was in the ER. And I hate oh. eyeballs. I just think it's the grossest part of the human They're body. The worst. And I, you know, it's a, that's actually one of the main decision points in, to being an ophthalmologist is are if you think eyeballs are gross or not. That's that's a very important point. Uh, yeah, my best my best friend's an ophthalmologist. We went through medical school together, and she obviously had a different experience. She did an anterior chamber fellowship. I'm like, what? It took you two years to learn three millimeters. Like, what's up with that? Seriously, and there's like what six different subspecialties for this tiny little. Yep, it's 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 outrageous. The retina is like 500 microns thick, and you can uh, do a whole profession in it, which is good I because I don't know anything about the retina for the most part. I well, I mean, I we enough. all want our retina to be functional, and but it's like if the retinal surgeon needs the OR, then it's like psh, full stop. Yeah, yeah, and um. So, but going one lecture, one lecture of ophthalmology, it hasn't gotten any better. It's like, it's, in fact, I think maybe it's gotten worse. It's, it's like a part of a lecture now. It's just, it kind of brought into, I don't know, ENT or something. So it's it's, uh, very, uh, not great. Well, you know, you think about things like, I don't know how many lectures we spent on the Krebs cycle, but we did actually, I do remember Mm -hmm. that you know, I remember sitting in, like, we had to do like a breakout group. There were like eight or 10 of us. And, and I thought, you know, now looking back, you think, well, like, it's good to know the summary of the Krebs cycle, mm-hmm. but that's it. Unless you become a metabolic expert, but yeah, just generally knowing the word Krebs cycle and, yeah. um, and I, I can tell you, I know it has something to do with energy, Yes. Making ATP. Energy. I think that's it. That's 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 all any of us could ever hope for understanding and remembering. So I don't know. I think that I think there's a lot of basic science that, you know, actually could be reshuffled to residency, basically. You know, that it's more important in certain specialties. But yeah, no, what do exactly. I, know? I think no, I think that's a good point. Um it's uh just tailoring it to to your field, like if you're you know, certain, certainly there's some specialties that do more with genetics and that would definitely be more applicable, I think. Right. Yeah, and I mean, why like, don't we take out the Krebs cycle portion and replace that with patient communication? There you go. How about yeah, that? <laughs> I mean, I think that that's, that's one thing my school did actually very, very well. Our teaching on the wards was spectacular mm-hmm. and we had really great people for, you know, te- you know, about how we interacted with patients and, and how to talk to them. And, and that was actually, I think, an an incredible strength of my school. And that's something I think that, that we need more schools to have. I mean, as a subspecialist, a lot of times what I'm doing is I'm saying the exact same thing Mm -hmm. as the other doctor said, I'm just saying it in a way that people can understand that makes sense to them. Yeah. That happens like, like 30% of what I see is not something special that I like, you know, like I take care of people who have graft versus host disease of the vagina, right? Like that's really subspecialized. But a lot of what I, I do is, is not at all. It's very general, but through whatever sequence of events, it just didn't make sense to the person, or maybe they had a complication with the therapy, and that the ability to kind of explain that, I think, is is something that I trace back to my really great training at the University of Manitoba. I was going to ask you where where you went to, to did your training. Did you do it all of it in Canada? Yeah, so University of Manitoba in in Winnipeg mm-hmm. for a medical school. And then I did my residency at the University of Western, which is in London, Ontario. So, uh, and OBGYN in Canada is five years. So it's an additional year of training. Okay. And so, yeah. so you do how, med school is four years. Uh, yeah. Med school is then... four years, then four years of medical, uh, four years of medical school, five years of residency. And then I did a fellowship in infectious diseases. And that's how I came to the oh, States. Really? I went to Kansas city. Oh. Which one? Uh, I lived in Kansas City, Kansas, and okay. we and the hospital was on the Kansas side. So, and I was there for six years, and that was my first introduction to living in the United States. That is a, that's trial by fire. 
Well, it was, you know, I, I was under the mistaken assumption. I didn't really understand the whole right wing sort of religious politics of the mm-hmm. United States because I grew up in the Midwest in Canada, which is really very liberal. Mm-hmm. Right. So I just assumed that Kansas City being straight, straight South would be very similar. Um, and I think one of the first questions someone asked me was what church I went to. And I made a joke and I said, Church of Satan. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> And so they thought well. I was. Uh, they thought I was serious. <laughs> <laughs> like I, like As they never clutched in their my children li- a little closer uh, to yes, them. Yes. <laughs> like never in my life would I have thought to ask somebody what church they went to. I just that would not. That was just not part of my that's, vernacular. That's a solid joke uh, and a daring joke for someone coming from uh, Canada to live in the United States in a place they've Who never lived before. Female reproductive health. <laughs> that's. I love it. That's great. <laughs> Well, you know, I always, I'm like the person blundering ahead, you know, is there, if, if there's a door I can ram my head in it shut, I'll ram my head against it 20 times before I look for the handle. I like it was 15 minutes in. We've already talked about the church of Satan a little bit. This is good. Right. I like it. You know, I, and you need to say that with the uh, church lady voice. <laughs> <That's> Satan. <right>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to make sure we get to, I think you have another story for us, right? Oh, well I do it. I mean, it's again, it's a it's a personal story. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, cause I, you know, whenever people talk about their most unusual cases, certainly from my standpoint, I think people would be identifiable. So I, I try to, to shy away from that. Cause in OBGYN, the weirdest stuff can happen. Like that's this. And my case is an example of that. You know, we always say in medicine and you probably have the same belief that the weirdest, awful, craziest things can happen to to doctors mm-hmm. or they often seem to. And so I had a triplet pregnancy and I went in, I ruptured my membranes at 22 and a half weeks. And I delivered my first son who, you know, who died, which we planned not to resuscitate. And then I managed to stay pregnant for three and a half more weeks and delivered my other two sons at 26 weeks. And they had the whole, you know, NICU experience. And then on top of it, because, you know, being, you know, 783 grams and 843 grams wasn't tough enough. Um, My son, Oliver, who is the smallest, had a severe congenital cardiac defect. So Mm. he had um, a severe pulmonary valve stenosis and a large ASD. And he needed to have surgery on his valve, but he was too small for any of the equipment. Mm. Wow. So you're in this like, uh, how does this happen? You know, trauma, you know, you know, total just like what universe have I been plopped into? And so, you know, getting my kids through all of that and, you know, they were on oxygen for a year and my son, Victor, you know, uh, was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Fortunately, it was mild, but, you know, I took a year off to work with him. Uh, Mm -hmm. you know, Oliver had severe lung disease of prematurity. That's actually why we had to leave. We were living in Denver. We had to move to sea level um, because his his lungs were just so bad. You know, he had repeated, you know, admissions. You know, he had RSV when he was two and a half and was, you know, in the PICU. And it was Mm -hmm. like, uh, this could be it, you know? So I'm having like major flashbacks with all these like RSV cases that are surging right now. Um, and so, yeah, that was quite a, you know, we, we met every single pediatric subspecialty and that's where I actually learned more about the eyeball because both my kids had retinopathy of prematurity. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. You you must've interacted with almost every area of medicine. You know, there are, did they Every know you? single one. <laughs> they probably. Yeah, I, it was. They were, you know, they were all great. Um, yeah. except I had the same, or you know, very similar insurance issues that I see that you know mm-hmm. that you you talk about on Twitter, uh, and uh, they um, at one point I actually threatened the CEO of one of the hospitals with, <laughs> with, um, with having a news conference, um, with my two kids on oxygen. So the public could see what would happen. And I, wow. I got around the issue was, um, I had been billed twice for an x-ray. So, oh. um, the insurance company wouldn't pay for the second billing of course, which actually it's not the insurance company. This was actually not the insurance company's fault and the hospital wouldn't, um, wouldn't drop it. And they sent me to collections. So, weird. so, 
I Ugh. faxed, I called up the the CEO's um, secretary, looked it up and said, hi, this is Dr. Smith. I'm your new orthopedic surgeon who's going to be starting next week. Um, I just need, uh, I, you know, I need your fax number so I can send some documents. And they gave it to me. So then I faxed the letter. This was, you know, before, you know, when we did those things and said exactly what I was going to do. And that I said it wasn't a threat. It was a promise unless they pulled the bill from collections. And they wow. did. Oh, wow. Good for you. Oh, we, we also, we, we still fax everything. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's true. In medicine, you do. Yeah, we're way behind the times. But, um, you know, for a lot of people, you know, the first really, uh, uh, first real interaction with the medical system as a patient or as a family member who has, uh, you know, members of their family going through serious medical issues um, the dealing with the insurance side of things is just a, sh a huge shock. Was that the case for you? Was it, was it, were you having to like learn things on the fly, figuring out what all these different moving parts were, why you're bil being billed for certain things? And, and, uh, was that a, a huge learning process for you? It was, but I think actually I was better off than most American physicians because when I came from Canada, I didn't know the system at all. So I had to learn it. And so the person who taught me about it actually was the billing person at the University of Kansas. So I actually learned a lot about like how it all worked, what happened when things, you know, because I didn't know the importance of filling out a billing. Like I like this was literally like learning a completely new language yeah. with a different alphabet, like not, you know, like, like what do these characters even mean? Like, so I had to learn it from the ground up. So when this happened, I think I had a greater awareness of how the system had failed me, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and so was able to sort of pull more strings. Uh, but it was, I mean, my kids had, you know, that lost their oxygen benefits six months into the year. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, so the ridiculous. fact that you had to resort to, to, you know, threatening the CEO of the hospital, you know, yeah. to, to, for them to do what's right, really really speaks to just how people are taking advantage in this system. Yeah. And, and also the thing that motivates everyone is, and always has been bad press. So, yeah. you know, we like to think people would be decent people and some of them are, but sometimes you just have to. We, I mean, we stink. still see it. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, we, we've done that yeah. a few times, uh, you know, when I was going through the cardiac don't have arrest any other recovery option. and yeah. right. dealing with health insurance, you know, it's like at some point you get, fed up and you go to Twitter and you, you know, you make a big stink about it. Yeah. And, and then they want to help you. And well, yeah. Well, and they're counting on people not doing that. It, right. They're counting on people being afraid of being sent to collections. And, right. you know, I mean, I had the same thing happen. I think you had, had tweeted about, you know, having somebody out of network who was looking after you and, you know, you're unconscious. How are you even supposed to like, right. like, what is that? Yeah. And, you know, that happened to my son. He got in and he needed surgery. It was all pre-approved and everything from the insurance company. And I get the bill and the anesthesiologist wasn't part of the system. Yeah. And again, <laughs> I called network, the CEO right? of the yeah. hospital. I'm like, that's your problem. If you didn't schedule the right person with me, yeah. that's your problem. And going to have a news conference about this tomorrow. Is this what you want? Me on the steps of your hospital holding my kid? It's like, no, that's definitely not what they want. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, you know, and going back to your point about, uh, you know, being a physician, you know, or being someone from Canada who's a physician, you, you had that head start in, in learning and, and being able to navigate the system. And that's the thing like, I, I try to talk about with people is, is as, as, as hard as it is for us as physicians to navigate this thing, it's just so much harder for people who are not in medicine and they got to, they got to just figure this out from scratch. And, and again, these insurance companies that they, they're, they, they're banking on people just giving up and being and, afraid and, and accepting just doing what they say, accepting what, what the outcome is. Of yeah. And you're so overwhelmed, right? Cause you're sick. I mean, yeah. right. you're sick. That's actually how I got into being active on social media was after I finished, you know, not finished, but, you know, when I sort of came up for air when my kids were about five, I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. I just went through this basically war zone situation with my kids and, and we've come out 
relatively unscathed. I mean, scathed, but yeah. in the grand scheme of things. And I would find myself sitting in the doctor's office with my kids at all these visits. I think in the first month we had 40 visits with special, like, so, you know, I would, and I would hear people crying about their interaction with a doctor or frustrated about this medication or that. And I would say, okay, what you need to do, you need to say this the next time you go in to see the doctor, or you need to use this word. And so I was helping all these people sitting in the waiting room because you're there sometimes for hours waiting with like two kids on oxygen. It's just awful. And so that's why I wrote my first book was to help people who had premature kids navigate the system. Mm -hmm. And then I, someone said to me off the cuff, well, you should get on Twitter. That's how people are promoting books these days. Mm -hmm. And that was back in 2010. That was it. Um, rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Jen, for sharing those stories. Uh, just unbelievable. That's, and, and I, there's just so much, God, we could talk about it for a long time. Mm. There's a lot to, to that you could get into. And uh, uh, we appreciate uh, you taking the time. And we're going to take a, a short break and come back. And we're going to play a game together. We're gonna, it's going to be fun. I, I just came up with this like a couple days ago uh, that it's going to be called Common Ground. And uh, it's, uh, we're going to get into the rules here in a second. But, but you know, we'll be right back with that. We just want to give a big thank you to our listeners. Yeah, it's Thanks. not easy to listen to you. That's that's true. It's, it, I really appreciate. Although I do have a a, like a nice Radio voice for voice. for a podcast. Um, it's a new show. All right, we want you to spread the love. So share with your friends and family, uh, whoever you want. Um, uh, please leave a rating and a review. You can be honest with us. We can take it. All right. I've been on social media for a while. I can accept some negative feedback if you have any, but we want you to uh, tell us what you think. All right. Um, later today, we're going to share some of our own medical stories. Um, share yours. Tell us your stories. Uh, send them in to knock knock hi at human content.com. Uh, also, you can check out our Patreon. Come hang out. Yeah, uh, it's fun uh, over there. Uh, yeah, there's other members of the knock knock hi community. Uh, uh, you'll get early access uh, to episodes. Uh, check out bonus episodes. We've got all kinds of stuff there. Yes. Um, uh, exclusivity that's right and just hang out with us all right that's where the party is yeah so uh, uh Let's check get back it out to the show you've gone on long L enough I, okay that's fine all right back to the show and we're back and we are going to play common ground so i asked jen to put together a list of similarities between two very dissimilar fields gynecology and ophthalmology. Uh, and uh, this is something that I, I try to do whenever I you know talk to different specialties and I, I try to find some kind of similarity. It's actually very hard for our two fields. So I thought it'd be fun to go back and forth. All right, we're gonna take turns and we're gonna see how many of these things, how many similarities we can find between our two fields. Uh, and so um, uh, Jen, I'm gonna let you go first. All right, okay, what do you uh... got? Speculums. Speculums. I, I had that on my list. You stole it from me. Okay. <laughs> that's that's good. Now they're very uh, slightly different speculums. Yours are bigger than mine. Larger. Absolutely yeah. larger. And don't have the weird hooky things now, that wait, keep the eyelids open. Wait, you have a hook on something that goes in your eye? Well, it, it's 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 uh it's the speculum part. It's the part that hooks into the eyelid. Okay, that should not be okay. Phrase. But that th that, be that's the next ever. question I had was uh, whose speculum oh. is scarier? And I think I, speaking oh. as a woman and human being, I'm more scared of of the hook in my eye. I think Having, that, I think that's the answer then, because I can't yeah. really speak to and any other. What type do you of think, speculum. Jen? Um, well, I certainly could not watch when my children had the eye speculum in their eyes and they were having their retinopathy of prematurity exams. I was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Do people ever vomit in your. Oh, no. Come on. It's not that bad. Oh, well, I kind of feel like it's, I need to vomit right now. Okay. It's uh, it, it's fine. You know, it's a little bit more dramatic appearing when you're actually when you're putting it a little because we have pediatric speculums for. for right. Neonates. So do we. <laughs> there you go. Another, Another similarity. Um, 
and uh, and so the the uh, the kid ones are it's a little bit more dramatic appearing because the babies are so small and and you just have this thing it's like really stretching their eyelids. You know, open. this sounds like torture, right? All right, maybe we should move on to a, 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 a to my first um, uh, similarity here. I have dilation. <laughs> oh, very yeah. good, very good. Very different types of dilation. You know, I've had both. Um, yours is worse in Again? the eyeballs. Yeah, no I hate way. that. Oh, I hate it so but, bad. But yours is because it's uh, connected to contractions. It's very painful. You know, I don't think the dilation itself is painful, though. It's the contractions, sure. But I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Jen. But I think yeah, the, it's the, the dilation contractions that is... produce the dilation that right. are, are that are the actual pain. Here, here's a question: right. What if ophthalmology eye, eye dilation was just as painful. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. Like the dilation in ophthalmology is painful. No, it's not. Yeah. To me, I hate it. Oh, because oh, so you're, you're sensitive to light. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I lasts. don't like those drops that like numb your mm. eyes. Oh, your I eyes shouldn't so be numb. Yeah. It's horrible. It's horrible. Good. We're, we're hitting on all the worst parts of ophthalmology here. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> All right, what okay. do you what do you got, Jen? Your turn. Lubrication. Okay. Lubrication, yes. Yeah. Because we we both take care of uh, mucous membranes. Yeah. Right. That's a cute and, term. And too. a dry eye is probably about as is uncomfortable ah, yes. as a dry vagina. That's true. Sure. We have artificial tears. That. You have. And we have artificial, artificial tears for the vagina. Yeah, we call them vaginal moisturizers, but okay. yeah, not artificial tears. That would be like, I know your vagina wants to cry, but it can't. So here are some tears. Good. I like that. That should be the name of your next book. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> vaginal tears. I know tears. your vagina wants to cry. Yeah. <laughs> but it can't. It's... But it can't. <laughs> okay. I guess that's what you'd say in response to uh -huh. A really bad sexual encounter. My vagina wants to cry, but it just can't. It's parched. <laughs> Sorry. There you go. This is uh, this is turning out better than I would have ever hoped. Um, <laughs> I love it. Okay. All right. How about um, gonorrhea? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ocular gonorrhea, cervical gonorrhea, mm -hmm. rectal gonorrhea. Yes. It's Absolutely. um, it's it's very. It's probably more common. Uh, in your field than it is in my field. I've I've seen one case of it in my career so far. Uh, it's always um, it, it's an interesting conversation to have. Um, yeah, I mean it's this is one of those things where you know screening has made such a massive difference in getting people into prenatal care, and then you know universal treating at birth, and obviously it's one of those things that certain segments of the population, be it you know, uber anti-vax or uber right wing, you know, are trying to get rid of, you know, and I think people forget, you know, how many of these things that we take for granted, they've actually, how they've helped people. Yeah. I was going to follow that up with chlamydia. Uh, there you go. I was, I was, that was, I was expecting to hear next. Um, Kristen is just, is, I'm squirming. is, is dying I'm right so now. I'm so uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It's all in the eyes. Like I'm, I'm like it's the wanting eyes. Oh, to yeah. scratch my eyes. It's the eye stuff for me. I can't do it. Ugh. It's it's um you know usually in with with chlamydia and gonorrhea usually with as far as ophthalmology goes it's conjunctivitis. So it's it's lots of discharge. Oh, and, oh god. Uh, really is it the, is but, it but discharge another similarity. <laughs> yeah, discharge. Right. There you go. Um, what were you with, say? with chlamydia, I was going to say with chlamydia, isn't there cobblestoning underneath the mm -hmm. the yeah. eyelid? Do yeah, I remember it, that correctly? It, you, you did, that's correct, absolutely. Uh, and you're gonna you'll make it through. We're 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 almost. I think this was the worst thing that I had on my list, or at least the most difficult for a non medical person like you to listen to. Um, and uh, okay, so, so you're okay, I'm in okay. the interest of. Whew. Making sure Kristen wants to keep doing this podcast with me. <laughs> we will um, we'll move on. Um, okay. I only have like a couple more uh, okay. that I could come up with. Um, is it my turn? I think it's my turn. Yeah, you, you, would, turn. you did chlamydia. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, fundus. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. What, what I was really yeah. proud of myself. What's a fundus? Fundus. It's, a, it's an anatomic Do I wanna... term. Uh, why don't you, Jen, explain what the fundus is? And yeah, the fundus area. is the sort of the top or the body of the uterus. 
So oh, the uterine okay. fundus. Yeah. So when we measure during pregnancy, we're measuring the fundal height. Right. Yes. I that. And for me, the fundus is the back of the eyeball. The back of the yeah, eyeball. Yeah. So you're looking at the retina. You're looking at you through the pupil into the back of the eye. We just we call that the the fundus. The fundus so exam. the fundoscopic exam oh, is yes. you're okay. you're using an ophthalmos. You've heard that term? Sort of. I halfway listen to you. Sometimes. sometimes she listens to what I have to say. Um, <laughs> and uh, so there you go. The fun. It would. And there's also a a fundus in the stomach. There's like multiple yes. uh, fundi uh, yeah. in the human body. I I don't know. That's- if there are other funduses, funduses? Uh, elsewhere, but at least that's one that we have in common. Yeah, I that was a really good one. That I, was the I, only I like, like anatomic one. structure that I could come up with that is remotely right. similar between the yeah. two of us. So okay, so um, I was going to go with um, uh, blocked uh, follicles, sebaceous uh, glands, things like you get styes, ah, we get yes. ingrown hairs, um, folliculitis, that kind of thing. It's just, yeah, we could just do hair in general. That's a, that's yeah. a, that's a good one. Uh, we have, um, eyelashes. Eyelashes. Yeah. yeah. I, I guess eyebrow. I don't know if I, I have one. I have one. Oh. Um, speaking of that, you both, well, I don't know what they are technically called in, you know, gynecology, but you have the mites that I hate. And I think you yes. have Demodex. something We have, we have Demodex mites. Uh, we don't have those, but pubic lice can affect yeah. the eyelashes. Oh, God. Oh, God. That's true. That's yeah, right. I've never seen that, distance. but I, it is exactly. Yeah. There you go. Thank you for bringing that up. You're Kristen. welcome. I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. a little surprised that that's, that's my contribution to today, but there you go. <laughs> So that's the similarity that 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 eyelashes are the same distance apart as pubic hair, which makes the ideal ecosystem for pubic lice. Okay, to I did not know go. that. You're welcome, everyone. I did yeah, not know so that. Yeah, so it's so that's why you can't get pubic lice on other parts of your body because it needs the hair follicles that like the right jumping distance or something. Yeah. Oh, nice. I mean, I've said that very eloquently. Yeah. I know. Yeah. That's good. I, that's something well, I could, I could bring up with both. my patients. That's yeah. good. That will totally make them feel comfortable as it. you're coming really close. <laughs> Did you know <laughs> this has nothing to do with you, but I just thought you might want to know about the, uh, the, the migration patterns of pubic uh, lice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So that's a good one. That's a good one. Okay. That is someone's career, by the way. That, that, that's fine. You know, we need we need smart, hardworking people in the pubic lice world. That's of course. Thank you, whoever you are. <laughs> um, okay. Ooh, I think I, there's just like one more. I have uh, um, anatomy that confuses people. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, because I don't want to speak for you, Jim, but I know that um, I, I see a lot of what you are talking about on social media uh, at times is uh, related to people very much uh, misunderstanding and not really understanding uh, female anatomy. Yeah, I imagine it's the same thing. People don't don't know their sclera from their retina. Yes, exactly. And so uh, it's, it's um, people... Don't also don't know that whenever you lose a contact lens underneath the eyelid, it's mm-hmm. not going to go back into your brain. It's you know things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it can't. By the way, I don't know if you. I assume you you knew that that's not the case. Um, well, I actually have a fear of contact lenses. <laughs> Ooh. That's a healthy fear to have. I I yeah. actually encourage I think that. You do too, even though you don't wear them. I don't. I I have a, a, a fear for a different reason. I see what goes wrong with contact lenses. Um, a lot of wrong. What's things. your fear, Jen? What's your fear? Well, I I I literally can't like I, the idea of putting a contact lens in my eye is like makes me want to vomit. Like touching the, your I, eye, the touching yeah. and fishing around, <laughs> and I I can't I can't put eye drops in. So once I got like a splash in my eye, the way I dealt with it was I filled a sink with water. I can open my eyes underwater. I put my face in the water and open my eyes and swish okay. them around. Oh, that's it's very good. creative that's, solution. You know, people come up with very interesting ways to to get contacts in and out. And uh, but you're not alone. There are a lot of people that just cannot touch, come near their eye. In fact, um, I think Kristen, you mentioned, you know, what do people throw up? You yeah, know, whenever yeah. I'm doing yeah. things to their eyes, they don't 
throw up usually, but I do have a lot of vasovagal responses. Oh, hey, that might be another and that's similarity. similarity. <laughs> I was going to go with vagal responses. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. How does if it come up for on, you? If you tug on the cervix, you can absolutely. So in the operating room, if we're doing like a vaginal hysterectomy, I have absolutely had it with a, you know, an older patient where you go to pull on the cervix and all of a sudden you hear this boop, boop. Mm. And the anesthesiologist is like, just stop what you're doing. <laughs> and then boop, 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 boop. And then you, he goes, okay, do it again. You tug oh, again. Interesting. Boop, boop. Oh, nope. Sorry. That's just not going to be happening. So, um, you know, if you, if, you know, but, but yeah, so vagal response from stimulating the cervix. And that's why, you know, some people probably find some people hate the feel of pap smears. Mm -hmm. Other people like the brush, other people don't notice it at all. You know, we're all why same with the eyeballs. Probably some people can tolerate a lot more touching than others. Yeah. There, there are two situations which will get a, like a vagal response. Uh, one is, is just in the process of doing an eye exam, like coming near someone's eye, just cause, you know, you can see it. They start getting real sweaty. Oh, uh -huh. uh, they just kind of like, I'm looking through a microscope, their head is in the mic and all of a sudden their head just disappears. And I look oh. over and they're just kind of <laughs> slumped over in the chair. And then we get the ice packs out and we right. lay them back and, you know, the smelling they, salts. Yeah. They, they do okay after that. But then the other one is similar to what you talked about with, you know, moving the cervix around is, uh, um, eye muscles. So, oh. um, so with like extraocular muscle entrapment, like if you have an orbital fracture and one of the muscles around the eye, usually it's the inferior rectus, the one on the bottom part of the eyelid of the eye, it gets trapped in that fracture and starts pulling. Then, um, Oof. then that can cause a dramatic decrease in heart rate. Well, now that we've lost all of our listeners, oh, there you go. That's okay. Awful. Uh, I, I think, I don't know. I, I think I had hit on all of my similarities. Can you think of any yeah, more? I mean, my last one was going to be just like the close personal nature of the exams. <laughs> yes. Yes. Very much so. Because <laughs> nowhere else in medicine is it like that close, you know? It's <laughs> yeah. very yeah. true. We're in Both fact, windows to the soul. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> that's good. I, I, I think, I think we found more than I thought we would. That's, yeah, it's that's pretty good. Pretty They're good. They're all disgusting, and I think you two might be sociopaths. But oh, aside from go. that, all right. it was fun. I'll take it. <laughs> hey, I'll take it. Sure. <laughs> well, uh, Jen, thank you so much. This was so much fun. Uh, we just love talking to you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and before that, we before we wrap up. Uh, tell us what you're, what's going on in your life. What do you have any projects you're doing, books you're writing? Yeah, so I'm working on my fourth book, um, which is called Blood, the uh, Blood, the Science, Medicine, and Mythology of Menstruation. <laughs> Badly yeah. needed right now, I think. Awesome. And uh, yeah, and this, it comes when out is it in September. Out? September. Oh, September. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. And then um, I'll be working, I think, hopefully on the next series of my podcast, Body Stuff, next year. Maybe we should do an eye episode. <gasps> I would love that. I just, any chance I can to like, I told myself I wouldn't try to talk about eyeballs too much in this in this podcast. Uh, I think I you probably failed. overdid it a little bit with the eyeball <laughs> stuff. But anyway, um, and then where can people find you? Yeah, they can find me. Well, while Twitter's still afloat, um, they can find me there at Dr. Jen Gunter on Instagram, Dr. Jen Gunter, TikTok, Dr. Jen Gunter, Mastodon, Dr. Jen Gunter on the med social in, uh, instance, go. I think they call it. And um, my blog is called The Vagenda. There That's you go. That's a perfect name. That's lo I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much. This was a pleasure. I oh, appreciate thank you, you guys on. for having me so much. And I wish you all the success. You too. Well, thank you too. Take care. Thanks again to Jen Gunter. That was great. That, that was, was so fun. much fun. She's she's the best. I really I, like her. I look up to her a lot. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, and but, so before we go, uh, we're gonna uh, take a look uh, at some of the favorite, um, some of our favorite medical stories that were sent in by listeners. Uh, and so we got a couple good ones today. Um, so uh, here's the first one. Uh, I'm just gonna read it off. I broke my knee playing basketball when I was in college, but the funny part is it happened when I was stoned. Oh dear. So after I landed, I knew it hurt, but I was so high, I started laughing. Nobody believed me since I was hysterically laughing, but luckily somebody who was there was a nurse. Thank God. Uh, they saw the blood fill my knee. 
a friend brought me to the hospital and then I was on crutches for three to six That's months. A fun one to explain to your mother. That's also uh, a, a, quite an endorsement of marijuana nurses, as <laughs> of nurses, <laughs> yes, but uh, for marijuana as a pain management. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Why cry when you can laugh hysterically? <laughs> I love that. That's great. Um, let's see. Here is uh, uh, the second story here. My husband was in the hospital and wanted candy after his surgery, but you're not supposed to have candy after surgery. He threw up blue candy all over himself. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is why you're not supposed to have candy after surgery. I love that it was blue too. Like it was just, it's like when you're yeah. at the store and you buy clothes and you walk out with the ink thing and it explodes everywhere, right? <laughs> you, when you try to take it off yourself. I feel like that's like that, like a... Like a, you know, alarm that lets everybody know that you did this thing you weren't supposed to do. There's there's so much uh, time and energy that goes into making sure patients um, either eat or drink or don't eat or don't drink <sighs> around surgery. Yeah. And like we're. It's so confusing. It, it's confusing, right? It's, it's like uh, there's this like eight hour limit, but then, you know, within two hours you can have sips of water or, or an ice chips or and it's like, it, it's just, yeah. there's so much into it go, that goes into it. And as a, on the surgeon side, um, it's, uh, you know, one of the classic conflicts uh, yeah. between surgery well, and anesthesia and have, is whether or not patients have to get canceled for th- Because they things. ate something or yeah, had that, ice chips. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe not blue ice candy. chips, but just blue candy. Exactly. <laughs> I have so many questions too. Like, like where did he get the candy? Like, did this person give him the candy? It kind of sounds like, you know. Yeah, the person, uh, it, it does sound like. Like are they maybe the person knew better? Are they implicit in this crime, or did they just let this person <laughs> suffer their own natural consequences? I'm, I have so many questions. I could see that the husband being very persistent, and and the 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 spouse saying, you know, to hell with it, yeah, whatever. Fine. If Have you want to do this, this is on you. Yeah. All right, I'm not gonna clean up your blue vomit. Right. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, oh, I love those. All right. Well, thank you so much for those. You can send us your stories uh, in a couple different ways. You can reach out to us on social media. Uh, I'm, you know, just search Dr. Glockham Flecken on pretty much any social media platform, uh, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, uh, and uh, Lady Glockham Flecken That's is right. on Twitter. Twitter. Uh, you can send us your stories there, um, or you can email us at knock, knock, hi at human dash content.com. Knock, knock high at human dash content.com. Send us your weird, amazing, funny, outrageous, uh, harrowing stories uh, about uh, your time uh, as a medical professional in the medical field, whatever. Interacting you know. with the healthcare system. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anything you want, to, you want to belittle uh, health insurance companies, I'm all for it. Um, mm-hmm. And so, uh, uh, yeah, I think that was that was a great, great episode, great interview yeah. with, with Jen. We enjoyed it. Let us know. Let us know what you think. We want to hear feedback from you guys. This is uh, we're we're taking you all as the audience on this journey with us. Do you do you have your a favorite doctor or a person who uh, pretends to be a doctor on TV or whatever it is? Anybody that you think uh, that we should interview and talk with and play games with? Yeah, Yeah, game ideas, Mm -hmm. anything. We're up for uh, uh, really, you know, whatever you guys have in mind. So let us know. Um, Hit us up on social media um, or with email. And um, uh, I just also want to thank all the listeners. Thank you, everybody, for for being here with us, for leaving feedback, leaving reviews. We also appreciate this is a new podcast. We're getting started here. And so uh, if you want to leave a review um, on uh, any of wherever you're listening to the podcast, uh, and um, if you subscribe to us and comment about, uh, um, you know, either on on uh, YouTube or wherever you find uh, this podcast, um, if yeah, we and give if, you a shout if out. you like this podcast, you might check out some of the others by um, our friends at Human Content. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can you can find them too on Instagram and TikTok. Full episodes of this podcast will be up every week on YouTube at Doctor at D Glockenflecken. 
Uh, we also have a Patreon with lots of cool perks. There's gonna be bonus episodes where we, I don't know, do things like react to medical shows and movies, uh, you know, making fun of the medicine therein, um, hanging out with um, other members of the Knock Knock High community. Uh, we're gonna be active in it. We're gonna be interacting, posting, responding to comments. Um, also, uh, as a member of the Patreon, uh, you'll get early ad-free episode access. Uh, and then interactive Q and A live stream events. There's just, we're always coming up with new ideas. Uh, and so uh, we're excited about this. So check out the Patreon um, at patreon.com slash Glock and Flecken. Yeah, you can, they can come make fun of you with me. That's true. Yeah, I'm always, I, I, I welcome heckling, please. Uh, you can also go to our website. So thank you for listening. We are your hosts, Will and Kristen Flannery, also known as the Glock and Fleckens. Special uh, thanks to our guest, Dr. Jen Gunter, um, our executive producers, Aaron Corney, Rob Goldman, Shanti Brooke, our editor and engineer, Jason Portizo. Uh, our music is by um, Omer Benz V. Okay, so here's all the legal stuff. You're a doctor, not a lawyer, so let's see if you can do it. Should I try to do it as fast as I can? Yeah, do it as fast as you because can. Because this is not going to be the most popular part and of the And they podcast. usually, you know, in those legal things, they, they speak like 10x. Speak, All right, here we so go. I'll go. do it as fast. To learn about our Knock Knock Highs program and disclaimer and ethics policy, submission verification and licensing terms and HIPAA release terms, you can go to glockenflecken.com or reach out to us at knockknockhigh at human-content.com with any questions, concerns, or fun medical puns. Woo, you did it. Knock Knock High is a human content production. I think I did that quite well. I, I that was okay. Yeah, okay. solid right. like C plus. It's C plus. All right, we'll you go can, with maybe that. Maybe as we go, you'll get better. Thank you for being here with us, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Knock knock. Goodbye. Thanks for watching the episode. You can find more on that playlist over there. If you prefer to listen or you just had your eyes dilated, you can binge full episodes wherever you get your podcasts or join the party over on Patreon where you get early access episodes, hang out with us, get lots of exclusive bonus content. Hope you subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think.